welcome back everyone this is chase and joining me today uh from beautiful boulder as trent bush uh senior creative at at many different companies um from burton mountain hardware black diamond um do you mind trent share a little bit about where you're at right now um yeah, I'm, I'm actually, um, after a couple of years with, um, as a VP of design at, at uh, Mountain Hardware and then uh, running the sort of the apparel program at Black Diamond for the last couple of, day, couple of years, I'm back in Boulder um, full time, which is nice. And uh, I'm at a company called um, Global Brands Group Sports and Lifestyle, which is sort of a mouthful. But uh, the easy way to think of it, it's the, the company that runs um, Spider, Dekine Apparel. Uh, and Saga Outerwear. That's awesome. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah. again, you know, you've got a wealth of experience and uh, we're really born into this industry and wanted to talk with you a little bit today, kind of as a part of our history of gear series that we've been running. And um, you're, you know, you know, Bruce Johnson really well. And, mm-hmm. and uh, in a previous conversation, we talked about Frostline kits sure. and, um, you know, through those conversations and us publishing some of our work, we got reconnected and, and you shared a little bit about uh, your early history with Frostline and um, you're well acquainted with the company to say the least. So yeah, for sure. wanted to, wanted to dive into some of that history with you today. Sure. Absolutely. Um, I guess, first of all, um, we'll timestamp this whole conversation and just, you know, we're going through COVID-19 crisis right now and <laughs> you sure you're are. doing well, you're, you're kind of holed up. Um, right. You know, at home, how have you yeah. been doing during all of this? Doing, um, doing as well as as can be. You know, and I hope hope the same for you. You know, it's it's sort of unprecedented times, right? It's it's kind of wild. I mean, I'm used to like we were talking about earlier, flying almost for a living. It feels like whether you know it was the commuting I've been doing the last number of years, or um, I do a lot of work with factories all over, um, trade shows all over the world. You know, all kinds of things. And I'm used to traveling 150,000 miles a year on airplanes or more. Um, and it just came to a, a total, total halt. So it's been actually really nice um, in that respect. I mean, the whole thing is not nice, of course, but just the fact that I've been you know, really grounded. Um, it's, I've gotten a lot of chances and, and time to kind of, you know, not only reconnect with my own family and everything, but also to spend some time on things like this and actually going down the rabbit holes online of, of um, sort of memories and, and incomplete memories and being able to track those down because I'm in front of the computer. It feels like 24 hours a day. And some of my breaks have been just going back deeper into some of this, uh, these thought processes. You know, I, I do talk to Bruce Johnson um, via email a lot. Um, been talking a lot with, with Rachel Gross as well. And so, and, and with you, and it's just been a really great opportunity to kind of reflect on some of the stuff, pull out some of the old catalogs, go through some of the memories. Uh, so it's been, it's been interesting, but good. Well, we've, we've talked in our series um, about uh, Jerry, uh, Holy Bar, Frostline Kits. Uh, we, we've got a few others kind of coming down the, the pipeline. We've, yeah. we've been going through and really focusing on where you're based right now. Um, it kind of, Boulder as this incubator of so many outdoor brands. Um, I I wanted to dive in and just learn a little bit about what it was like growing up in Boulder. Um, and, uh, what, what was that time like for you and, and, uh, how did that influence you getting into the outdoor industry? You, you almost didn't have a choice. It sounds like. Kind of almost didn't have a choice, but I took a couple interesting roads. Um, you know, the, the greater part of growing up here, you know, Boulder's always been sort of a hotbed of entrepreneurialism. Um, but also, of course, the outdoor industry and all of that. You know, it's, I'm, I'm fourth generation Boulder. Um, you know, my kids are fourth generation natives as well, or fifth generation, I guess it is. Um, so we go back a long way. And it's sort of that common thread of the outdoor industry has always sort of been there. You know, my grandparents went to high school with uh, Leroy and Alice Hollybar. You know, so it's just, it's always just been sort of part of the culture of Boulder. Um, and it's been a really important and really pivotal sort of location for that, that stuff. And you've already talked about it. I mean, the Holly Bar thing goes back so far. And you can really trace a lot of the sort of current um, market and outdoor and mountaineering and, and outdoor apparel industry to, you know, a little house on, on Grandview Street in Boulder. Um, followed by Jerry Cunningham, Dale Johnson and Frostline and that kind of thing. And so I guess the 
you know, it's just been, it's just always been part of what I understand and what's going on, you know, and there's also that sort of free spirit side of Boulder that used to, you know, it, it existed, it still exists, it existed more back in the 70s and 80s when I was, when I was kind of growing up. I mean, Mork and Mindy, the TV show was being filmed here, Robin Williams and all that stuff was going on. And, and it was, it was, you know, it was pretty wild. Um, you know, in, in general, you know, just, I guess I could just give you a little history of, you know, the Frostline thing. Maybe that's a good segue into that just because my dad was one of the first employees at Frostline. Um, he was working at this place called uh, NCAR. It was the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So if you're ever in Boulder, you look up on the Mesa, there's this IMP architect design building, uh, super futuristic um, building, um, which was a national lab. And my dad was working there. They had a, uh, a metal shop. And this was back, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, outdoor equipment, just like I, you'll probably hear from everybody, was so incredibly expensive that people just couldn't afford backpacks or tents or whatever. So everybody was literally making their own. Um, and my dad made uh, some frame packs out of tube, aluminum tubes that were just laying around. He and a couple of people at, at NCAR, uh, as well as making tents and those kinds of things. Um, he had run into Dale Johnson just through a number of, you know, crossing paths and being around Boulder and being sort of interested in the outdoors uh, and invited Dale. He, you know, he, he talked to him and just said, hey, you know, I'm making some, making some packs and some tents. I think you'd like them. I'd love you to check them out. And so Dale came over to my dad's or to the house where I was born uh, in South Boulder. And uh, my dad had pitched the tent in the front yard, he had his packs and all that. And he was super proud of it. And, and He's like, okay, here, what do you think? You know, and Dale's like, yeah, it's okay. You know, we already kind of make things like that, but what do you do? And he's, my dad's like, well, I'm a graphic designer and graphic artist for National Center of Atmospheric Research. And um, Dale said, hey, do you think you could make um, brochures and catalogs and instruction books? You know, that kind of thing, anything graphic. And my dad's like, of course. And so he hired my dad instead of making tents and frame packs he hired him to do all the communications and marketing and, and everything for Frostline which which was a big deal I mean at that time it was all about catalogs right I mean that's that was the connection or that was a big yeah, part of the business right it was a big part of the business I mean even going back to the Hollywood days or the Jerry days like that was mail order was the way you found here especially if you were anywhere if you were an epicenter like Boulder or something like that you could you could go there'd be a store right um whether it was the, the mountain sports store, the Jerry mountain sports store, as it was called in, um, Holly bar had stores a little later, but you could, you could go and actually walk into a store and maybe buy some stuff or you could buy roll goods of fabrics and still make your own. Um, and then the catalog thing, the mail order thing really sort of took off, especially, um, sort of with the breakthrough. I think the big breakthrough was what Dale Johnson had done with Frostline, um, making at home do it yourself kits they were actually somewhat straightforward and easy and not overly complicated. Yeah. It sounds like from my conversation with Bruce about the Frostline getting started, Dale kind of broke off um, from Jerry because he found Jerry's kits to be frustrating or the way that they were explained. Right. Oh yeah. I mean, you would, you would start with a, I think it was like eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, grid paper with the, the pattern drawn out on it. You were supposed to figure out how to then, scale that up to an actual, you know, to a kit or to, to a pattern that you could use with fabrics and that would come in the kit. Um, and that was really kind of, I think, Dale Johnson's breakthrough was just make it super, super easy. Because at the time, most people had a sewing machine. It wasn't like it is now where most people don't. Back then, everybody sewed something and having a sewing machine was just something that every, every family had. So to be able to actually literally deliver them everything they needed to make um, a great jacket, you know, a great tent, great sleeping bag, whatever it was, they would actually deliver it um, in kit format and people would just sew it themselves along with a good instruction book. And it wasn't that hard. Right. How, how long had Frostline been around when your dad got involved? A uh, year. Oh, well, okay. So really early um, on, had they produced any catalogs or any print materials? In, yeah, they'd, until he um, they'd done a couple kind of leaflet brochure catalog kind of things. Um, and, you know, just kind of black and white. But then also, I mean, at the time, technology was really increasing too, and color printing and all those things were, were becoming more prevalent. Um, 
And I think, I don't, you know, I don't know the exact number. I think they were doing at the height in the late seventies, early eighties, they were doing 10 million catalog runs, you know, and they were, it, it was, it was big time for sure. Wow. Yeah. Was, give give me a glimpse into like what, what was that process when he was like creating, I don't know how much, how much of this were you around for? Like how much did you get to funny. see um, in this process? They, Dale had instituted four day work weeks way back in the day. Um, but my dad being sort of at a, in a more senior position, didn't, he, he still had to work. So he would actually take my brother and I in, in on Fridays. Um, a lot of times. Um, and I just, I remember vividly, watching him he had a drafting table and and back then there was no mac you know there was no computers and you you had to literally handset type or you'd had to hand you know cut ruby lift and and do all the layouts on on vellum it was a totally different situation um and that was just the sort of content but then there were you know as far as photograph you know photos and um all the things that you have to kind of go along with the kit. My dad handled all of that. So my brother and I, my mom, my grandparents, um, everybody, we were all in the catalogs also, um, you know, going and, and going to these photo shoots would be in the mountains, whatever it was, um, and, and be part of that. So it was, it was actually really interesting because we were really deeply engaged in sort of everything he was doing. And he would also bring the work home uh, a lot. Um, the other cool thing we there'd be you know my uncle ran the boulder store um we'd have warehouse sales and my brother and i would be my my grandparents would work the front desk and take the money and my brother and i would run around the warehouse picking the kit going into the where the down was and making sure we had the right down packs to go with the kit it was it was definitely a, a total family affair so we were around it was it, it, i mean frostly i mean people talk about brands being like a family and that's different now because phones and social media and all that, there was nothing like that. And so it really was, you know, company picnics and outings and all that stuff was just a normal part of a week. Well, it's, uh, that makes me think of my conversation with Bruce when we talked about Holy Bar and even after the company had been sold a few times and, and um, you know, kind of fell off in a way, like there were company reunions, right? And oh, yeah. in Boulder, right? And oh, maybe, maybe you participated in those, but um, you know, that's, it, it is kind of a different feeling and uh, yeah, kind of a different totally. time just in general, but. It was a different time. It was funny too, because it was actually, I, I never participated in a Holly Bar uh, reunion of any sort because that was, you know, they were the, they weren't the enemy, but they were, it was competition. Yeah. You know, those yeah. guys were, were hardcore competitors. You know, Dale Johnson was a, was a competitive guy. Um, and if it was Holly Bar, or it was Ultra or any of the other kit companies that were sort of, neck and neck you know dale wanted to win right well and 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 we kind of got into a little bit his motivation and and really kind of the trajectory of some of these older brands and it's interesting so many around the same time kind of started and then at some point they changed hands right or got sold or acquired and then the founder was no longer involved and and you know the company direction in some cases you know the company did did worse or poorly or dropped off or it's kind of interesting that time period when some of these companies started getting acquired and and what was the result after that but yeah i mean usually it's just like anything you know once the founder's vision has left the building it's only a matter of time right yeah it, so many companies and you see it um with the consolidation over the last you know 10 15 years typically that's sort of the case you know um whoever buys them tries to sort of find all the efficiencies and they sort of find the efficiencies at the, at the uh, you know, the soul of the company kind of leaves as the efficiencies grow. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, that's, we could get into a whole another conversation. Oh yeah. No, thoughts no, on sure. corporate consolidation. Uh, I yeah, think that, no, that'd, that'd, that'd be really be interesting. But, this um, is funny actually. I've got, I was, um, I pulled out a kit, like just, I still have something. That's my mom and my brother. Wow. That's um, great. And it kind of shows it's like the, you know, the fabric, the instructions, all the thread and everything. And then it's, um, it has the, the little down pods. Yeah. Um, but it's funny cause I opened this up for the first time and there's little plumes all over, like flying all over the room. And yeah. I just remember that so much from growing up that there was always 
like down plumes all over the place. And oh, yeah. It's just like reliving it. It's so yeah. funny. And like oh, gets totally. in your nose. It's just everywhere. Yeah, that's great. Um, kind of with that, um, what what kind of impression did did that experience, you know, the f- whole family really being involved and being surrounded by product, seeing product being, you know, made in a way or assembled, um, being involved in that process and then just being around your dad and, you know, setting type and, and doing a lot of this analog. Yeah. Um, what what impact did those experiences have on you and and the direction that you'd take your life? I mean, it, it was everything because I I. Um, that was just normal for me. I didn't know you couldn't just start a brand. I didn't know you couldn't just get your, you know, relative to help you. I didn't know you couldn't just walk down the street and get something sewn. So, um, you know, it my, it was a little different time, right? I was in the, sort of the next generation and youth culture and that kind of thing had, had flipped at that point. I mean, you know, my passion at the point was, was skateboarding. Um, when I was a kid and growing up in the whole thing, cause I was sort of what was being shown on TV that I mean, it was just skateboarding was like, was everything. Um, so I started working at a, um, at a skateboard shop. Well, it was skateboarding first, then being in Boulder back then in the winters, maybe it snowed more. I don't know. It, it feels like it did, but regardless, um, they used to put down sand on the streets. Um, from the first snowfall till they came around and cleaned up in the spring, literally you couldn't skateboard the streets because they were just covered in, in sand um, from snowfall or in case it snowed or whatever. Now they use chemicals. Um, so that's when snowboarding uh, sort of came about. So 80, 81, um, probably my, one of my uh, grade school friends, older brothers had a, got a snowboard and all of his friends. And so we started, snowboarding around the, just the local hills in, in Boulder and up in Chautauqua underneath the flat irons and stuff. Um, and so my sort of passion for skateboarding then went whew, over into, into snowboarding. You know, I was, I love skiing. My dad and my brother and I grew up just skiing was it. Right. And then when the skateboarding thing happened, then the snowboarding thing, it was kind of like all the things my dad loved, but it was mine. Right. And so it wasn't necessarily a rebellion against the outdoor and backpacking and fishing and camping and all the things, climbing, all the things that were part of my life early. But that was like my generation thing, which was super cool. So I started working at a, um, a shop that sold skateboards when I was in junior high. I was, uh, or I guess, middle school. I was, uh, I was 13 or 14, so like 1984. Um, shop called Wave Rave here in Boulder. And, and then it became a we talked them into carrying snowboards um so very long story to, to make it short um we started making apparel through waiver um and it was uh you know very rudimentary it was stuff made in in boulder um and then later just in denver just down the road and so we were able to make things locally that's when there was a sewing industry here um in a building in downtown boulder that was my my great uncle's auto shop back in the day um, so we just bought some polar fleece. My brother and I bought some polar fleece, cruised in there. And, and while we were away, not necessarily loving the, the apparel they were making, started our own company called Twist. And that's sort of how we got started in, in, in that whole thing. But again, there, was no, there were no rules. Nobody told you you couldn't do it. And from my family perspective, it was really cool because, um, you know, it was such a part of our culture just to sort of the whole DIY thing, whether it's a brand or a product or sewing something, you know, um, it, it was all just part of that culture. And that's what really got me started down that path. Uh, from there, from the twist thing, um, ran that business for a number of years. It was the first thing we had ever done, you know, high school friends and, and my brother and took it pretty big. We were, we were second in the, um, in the specialty market behind Burton, believe it or not, for a, a couple of years. Um, and it was just, you know, again, it was just, make it up as you go along and, and just like I knew how to do from my dad and from the frost time days. Um, th- what did you learn about design from, from your experience working with him? Is that when you realized that, was there a specific moment when you realized that, Oh, I want to be like, I have an appreciation for design. I want to design. Was there a um, moment? You know, I, I mean, like, 
especially with my man, I'm sure most kids really respect their dads. Like I always wanted to be like my dad, you know? So there wasn't any necessarily one moment I can think of so much as just, rem- just moments and remembering, you know, he'd do, uh, he'd bring home the new catalog or there'd be a new, and he'd have a, he had done a t-shirt design in the catalog he did, you know, and it was just all of those things sort of added up over time. Um, so there's no, you know, I didn't really have that sort of aha moment in, in, on that side of things. I think the thing that was really instrumental in sort of the early side of that was that sort of techni- the shift of technology in the late eighties, going from handset type and, and um, doing all the layouts and everything by hand um, to actually sort of the first Macintosh and the whole computer um, sort of computer design, you know, graphic design, that whole revolution was, was really more of a thing for me. Um, my dad had already left Frostline at that point. Um, Dale had sold it to Gillette, um, to the big, you know, sort of, I don't know, they make razors, right? Um, and the, like we had talked about, sort of the founder's vision was no longer there. So it, you know, and also at the same time, people weren't buying kits and making, they weren't sewing things anymore. You yeah. could buy it cheaper because everything had offshored by that point. Um, so really the, the computer revolution was more of a figuring out it was such a tool that we could actually do all of the things that they used to have a whole department for, especially with just my brother and two friends and, and me. Um, we could do all of that that they used to have an entire department for. Um, right. And designing the clothes part wasn't that hard because um, they were very, you know, everything had maybe a zipper, full zippers. Most things were like pullovers. It was really simple apparel at the time, but really being able to do the storytelling part of it. And that was, I think, the thing that I really got out of the early years in the Frostline thing is that, yeah, of course there was the product, but there was the story and the, the, you know, the, the brand being sort of the first and most important part of the product, I think is something that always stuck with me from the early days. And then that revolution of being able to literally do everything yourself um, was was sort of the the catalyst for what came later. How do you feel like? Um, I mean, you've had uh, you know incredible experiences working for brands like Burton, Mountain Hardware, Black Diamond. Your current position now. What um, do you feel like that understanding and appreciation of story and heritage brands in the outdoor industry? Do you feel like you've been able to bring that to companies? Does do you feel like that gives you a unique perspective when you're at some of these brands or it does i think in a lot of ways i think um and it really depends on the brand i mean obviously something like a burton um it it was funny i mean back then i I started working with those guys with with jake and and the whole crew in 97 i think and we'd already been running twist since 92 91 or 92 in a real way we started like in 1989 in high school but it was t-shirts but uh, you know Part of that, well, yeah, I mean, the cultural side of it was everything for me. I, we left working at Wave Rave because we didn't like the way they were making their clothes. Um, we wanted to do our own thing. We were much more skate driven. So we, you know, we really modeled twist around what we wanted to do in snowboarding and make it our way. When we got to Burton, my brother and I had both actually went and worked together because we kind of lost twist through a long story. But um, then when and started working at, at Burton, um, but even Burton at the time, like we didn't, we weren't really that into it. Um, we were into the brand and we were into the heritage, but we weren't really into what they were making. And we looked at it as sort of stodgy and antiquated. And again, granted snowboarding was very new, but even at that point there was already sort of a old school of snowboarding and there was the new school. And so, um, yeah, so we, we walked in and said, Hey, we love what you're doing, but we think that there needs to be less rules more innovation. Um, and so we pitched a brand that we called Analog, um, which became a sort of Burton's, um, their action sports answer for a number of years. They ran out of Southern California for a while. Um, and it was really kind of their four season surf skate snow um, brand. But that was, a, I mean, that's a good example of going in with, you know, that sort of DIY culture and also that other thought of that culture is everything. Um, and, and trying to change the market to sort of our own 
ideas of what is real and relevant and, and cool. Um, when you look at something like walking into Mountain Hardware or um, Black Diamond, you know, I'm not, it's hard to walk into companies like that with any sort of like real bravado. It's one thing to walk in when you've started your entire, you know, built your entire career on sort of progression and, and innovation in the snowboard market. That's one thing. But then to walk into hardcore outdoor companies, um, especially Black Diamond, um, is a, it's a different thing. You know, you really have to check your, any sort of ego you have at the door. Um, but I think it, it did help considerably to understand that mentality because it's funny, like the mentality of a black diamond and of somebody, you know, really hardcore into the climbing community, for instance, actually by, um, mentality, isn't that far from being super authentic and, and legit in, in skateboarding. The mentality is the same. The activity is totally different, but the, all the thought processes are the same. Um, of, you know, afraid of bigger companies getting involved or not loving growth and wanting to keep it kind of your thing, making equipment for you because first and foremost, if you make it for you because you know what is right, then you can actually roll it out to people who are like you around the, around the world, right? You know, Mountain Hardware is a little different only because they had been purchased by Columbia a few years before, which is a much bigger operation, of course. And, and I mean, it's magnitude bigger. Um, with systems and procedures and, you know, great people, unbelievable people, great place, um, great product. But it was, it was definitely a different, a little different mentality even than, than like, you know, obviously like the Black Diamond, which is more hardcore. Yeah. So being someone who's been involved in, in you know, a historic brand and, and then gone on and worked for other great brands as well, how do you feel like companies currently do at, at guarding their history and preserving their history. Uh, every company, it seems like, likes to lean back on it and say, oh, we've been around since yeah. next date, right? And, and in some ways, it seems like they like to do that for marketing purposes. And there's a lot of value in that, right? And sharing, mm -hmm. you know, where we came from and how long we've been around and how we do things. But how do you feel like companies in the outdoor industry do at preserving their own history? Uh, I mean, I think some better than others. For sure. I mean, there's the usual suspects, you know, the Patagonies of the world who are still run by the founder, right? Yep. So it's much easier to keep that thread all the way through. Um, other companies don't do nearly as good of a job. Um, but, it, you know, there's having been through companies, having started my own brands, all these different things, you can kind of see that, you know, there is a time when things that are old now and historic, um, you have great historical value, just seemed old at a time, right? It's probably like a band. Like they don't want to be playing the same music they were playing 20 years ago. They want to be doing what's new and progressive. Plus people change, you know, the, the personnel change. Um, I think there are a lot of brands that have no idea where they came for, from or how they got there. I mean, like right now, Jerry is a good example, right? You can buy it, you know, um, it's available in the marketplace, but I don't think anybody wearing it has any clue of where it came from. And, and you know, quite honestly, there's a lot of people who just don't care. Um, I have seen a real resurgence, I think, it, recently. I mean, you're a good example, right, of people wanting to know, well, what, what are the roots of this? Where did this come from? Um, and I've noticed that a lot. I, I do a lot of work, actually, in, in Colorado with the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. Um, I put together their, their snowboard collection, but I also work on the ski side and, and especially the, you know, the mission of preserving the legacy of the 10th Mountain Division. Um, and there's been a, a notable, noticeable resurgence in people caring about that sort of history. But I think it gets back to the, what we were talking about, the, just that core need almost, especially in this day and age where everybody's got a marketing angle and there's so much information out there. And so much of it is maybe, you know, superficial or not 100% true or a little bit made up or whatever it is. But to actually be able to, to trace the product decisions you make, especially if it's equipment, apparel is maybe not, not as important, but from a pure functionality standpoint, but still important to me. Um, 
you know, I think that's part of the story and that's what making an intelligent sort of brand decision. I think that's part of it and it should be. So right. if, if there's any trajectory of that being more important, I'm really happy to, happy to see that. And I'm glad like you are out there helping sort of uh, carry the torch. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see brands who are willing to put investment behind preserving their own history. And like you said, like Patagonia is kind of the example. Eddie Bauer, I know, has like a full-time yeah. archivist who's preserving their history. Um, I know REI as well. They've kind of got a yeah, committee. Burton, Burton does too. Burton I mean, does. Holman at, at Burton. That's right. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's good to see these companies who are willing to start guarding their own history. Um, I, and I'm happy they do that. And I'm happy that they're willing to share a little bit here and there. Um, sure. This is my university public institution side coming out, but yeah, of course. Um, it's, and, and, and uh, you know, I love the work that you do with the the ski museum as well, but I think there's a lot of value in, making those materials public right and sometimes when it's with a brand that's that's existing right it's still functioning and still you know i i can understand why they'd want to hold on to some of that um we've always been passionate about with our collection at the university is making that available for like the next generation of designers to look back in order to inform how they design for the future right and that's where a lot of my interest in this came about was you know, we're training in the outdoor product design development program, the next generation of product designers, but can we really do that if they don't know who Holy Bar is and who the heritage companies are and where this industry has been? I, they can, but could, I don't know, could they honor that heritage even more, be better designers if they understood where sure. the industry came from? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at it, look at it in respect to any other track in, in a university, right? Like if you're in math, you don't, teach everybody from, you know, there's a lot that they, they come up with, right? And you pay attention to what happened in the past because then you don't have to, you know, A, you know, repeat the mistakes of the past, right? B, you can take what's already been done and maybe your thinking can evolve and you actually start at a better point than if you didn't know those things. I mean, I, it, it, it's, I've lived a few cycles of it now, especially working with younger designers, also working with, um, a lot of freelance designers and having done a lot of freelance myself, even um, there, you know, every few years, the exact same idea comes from a new designer that had been done over and over. Um, and th- with th- all the enthusiasm in the world and it's, I love it. I love the enthusiasm, but the fact that it's not only has it been done, but either done to death, didn't work in the first place was too expensive. I mean, there's any number of reasons or it's just somebody's sort of almost their signature, right. Um, of a brand and you have to kind of respect that. If you know those things, then you can really, I think, advance your thinking and start from a much further along place than if you are not paying attention to that stuff. Because if you look at some of those old catalogs going back in the fifties and sixties, a lot of innovations were pretty forward for that time. Right. But who knows where they got them? Maybe they weren't in innovations at all. Maybe they had seen them as well. Um, I think if you don't know where you came from, you don't really, ha- you know, how do you know where you're going? And I think it's really important for people to, to look at that. Yeah. Dr. Gross and I talked quite a bit about this as well. And her whole work as a historian, right, is yeah. taking objects and history and, and like, and framing it in a larger context. Like that's mm-hmm. her, she, she defined that as her role, right. As a historian is, I'm I'm here to help put things into perspective within the larger history of, in her case, like the United States, right? Sure. Um, and and North American outdoor industry history, um, and so I think there's huge value in that too. Whether it's a student or someone who's currently in the industry, right? It's you look at one catalog and you can learn things, but if you look at a whole collection, right? Oh, yeah. If you look at two thousand catalogs and and look at the trends over time, and then think about what was happening at this point in time right and what was influencing you know the designs and and the creation of these products that's when you you really tease out insights i feel like it's super cool and if you look at that in in you know if you look at it you know obviously socioeconomic sort of instances like why were people making their own down jackets and sleeping bags like there's reasons right and the there was an ability to do that because people had sewing machines that kind of thing um it's interesting to see the socioeconomic side of, of what's going on at the time. But you can also sort of look at the trajectory of, of um, technology and 
how that has really informed a lot of these things. If you if you look back even in some of the old Frostline catalogs, they were one of Gore-Tex's first um, brands that you could buy at Gore-Tex, but you'd sew it yourself, right? And you'd stitch it, and then to, to um, seal the seams, you'd actually use, it was a, a seam sealant, and you'd actually just, you know, run it down and run your finger over it, and it would dry over time. And that's how you would, instead of taping seams like, like we do now or any other method, you know, you actually did that yourself. And you can kind of just see sort of this, this arc of history. Uh, it's really, it's really interesting. And you can see how people, there was just such a, a need um, for innovation and sort of what's next. And you can, like you're saying, if you have that broader context from early through even till today, you can really see the, the rise of, of sort of technology along with what's going on. It's, it's funny because there's a, I'm, I'm all for bringing back um, industry to US and, and everything. And, and my brother actually does that right now. He has a company called Nation Made and he does um, made in US products. But it, it, it is funny because people tend to romanticize some of that. But if you actually did try to go now and make a, you know, a black diamond jacket, for instance, um, it definitely wouldn't look like what you're used to just because the technology has sort of moved on, right? Even the, the equipment and the machines and the expertise and all that has sort of moved on, um, which is a bad thing in certain respects and it's not another because it's allowed innovation and technology to move forward at a, at a really good pace. Um, so again, just if you look at bookends of all the way back then and now, you can just really look at not only what's going on in, in the world, but also what's going on in technology at the same time. Even the quality of the catalog can tell you what's going on with technology. Right, totally. Um, All of a sudden there'll be fonts, you know? And yeah. <laughs> you'll know that it was probably, thanks Steve Jobs for that, right? Right, like oh, absolutely. Variety. Yeah. I, I think people feel like this industry is pretty young, and in mm -hmm. a way, in the grander scheme it is. Um, but after talking with Dr. Gross, I'm realizing it's older than I thought. And that helped put things in perspective for me. Like if you think of this industry as starting in the sixties, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of that, you know, or, it, you know, you think of the Patagonias, you know, or the Chenard equipments like coming around, right. And you, and, and North face and you think, Oh, that's when the industry started. You know, it seems really young, but if mm -hmm. you start to dig back and realize, Oh, there was Holy bar and Frostline yeah. and Jerry. And then even before them, Abercrombie and Fitch, right. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and, and you can go a little further before that. I mean, that's where Dr. Gross has kind of helped put things in perspective yeah. for me. It's like, well, if you make the jump to Europe, right. Yeah. And, and in Europe, you know, there's a much longer history there. We, she and I kind of talked a little bit about, you know, when you're a part of an industry and you feel like it's not very old, you don't feel like what you're doing is historic, right. Or, yeah. or meaningful in any, any particular way. But I feel like if people started to think, well, I've, I'm a part of this longer heritage, right? Of people wearing buckskin, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the same industry that I'm in right now. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I think having that perspective, I think people start to maybe guard their history a little bit more or see themselves yeah. as something a little bit bigger. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. And I think um, really what's actually happening right now, especially in the outdoor industry, it's really coming of age. Mm -hmm. It was such an, um, I mean, it was kind of a, having lived sort of inside of it and outside of it, um, it's always been its own bubble. And you'd go to the OR show every year and it'd be the same group of people wearing the same thing. Um, it, was, it was in such a bubble. Um, it's in its infancy in so many ways and so many things, you know, people are always like, oh, everything's been done. You know, in my, what, the things I try to work on right now, sort of on the innovation and technology side, I'd look at it like most things haven't been done. I mean, if you look at, a jacket. Yeah, it's got, you know, things maybe look better, but the core basic functionality isn't that different. It keeps you dry, you know. Nothing, regardless of what anybody says, nothing breathes, you know, that much better. I mean, there's better things out there and worse things out there, but um, you still have a hood that works pretty much the same with a cord in it. You saw the hem that's the same. You saw the zipper up the front, right? Um, so I, I'm looking at it really, I think it's a really great time where, yeah, it's been a short time behind us. Um, but I think 
you know, if you can take that in context, learn from that, don't redo that history and use it as a sort of the catalyst for what's next, especially with young students, the people, you know, the, the people you're working with. Um, incredibly important to understand that history and use it to their advantage to really lead into the next generation of what this thing is. And, and I've been thinking about that a lot lately, actually, because there are generational shifts. And I think we're due for one, to be perfectly honest, because like you said, Polybar or Frostline or um, Jerry or any of those early early brands were then sort of replaced by the North Faces and Patagonias, right? That was the next generation of that sort of equipment, which then was sort of, you know, like if you look at like an Arcteryx, something like that, sort of on that fringe. But I think now is the time for that big shift to happen again. And you see a lot of small companies coming up and now there's vehicles, especially being able to go to direct consumer. It's super exciting right now because it, it, it's a level playing field in a lot of ways. And people can come out with things that are totally left field and tailored just to what they, what their experience is and what they want their experience to be. And it's super inspiring. And they can actually find a life and a living um, focusing on just the part that they want to become theirs. Even if nobody else gets it, even if it never makes it to the floor of, you know, the main floor at OR, who cares? Like just go right to the people and, and, and create the future. That's, it's super exciting. Yeah. Well, with that said, what, uh, maybe what are some of your favorite heritage brands and maybe some that people have never heard of? Maybe they, they don't exist anymore. And then what are some of the brands that excite you today? Um, some old and new, I think would be interesting to hear. Yeah. I mean, it, it's weird from my perspective. Um, hmm. That's a, it's a, actually a really good question. I mean, of course, like I, like you look at something like Frostline, 99.9% of the people out there have no idea what that was, but it was such a pivotal thing in my life that, of course, that's on my list. But just because it was, it, it helped me become who I am. And I think it inspired a, a whole generation of people and Holly Bar and those things. And um, wow, current brands. I mean, there's people are doing really inspiring stuff all over the place. I mean, there's the thing that's that's kind of cool um, is just the the more localism kind of thing that's going on right now. I mean, just here in Colorado, I mean, you know, there's Topo, right? Yeah, those guys are doing doing really really cool stuff. If you look at um, kind of what's going on in like Jackson with like Steel and brands like that, they're doing exactly what I was talking about. They're just making exactly what they want, you know, what they believe it should be. Um, you know, there's, there's so many cool sort of little fringy brands, um, that it's kind of, you actually don't even need to necessarily pick a favorite because you can kind of sort of play the field on things that are going on. Yeah. There's a really cool, there's some cool things going on, even like even at the retail level. Um, if you know, um, like in the UK, like Ellis Brigham, a, a store there, which I got to know this guy Dave Whitlow really well over the years. He, he had started the Snowboard Asylum, which is the snowboard part of Ellis Brigham, which is like the biggest, one of the biggest retailers, outdoor retailers in the UK. Um, and they started a, a store called Outsiders, which really is just, you know, the most forward, small sort of brands in the outdoor space geared towards younger consumer base and it's so cool and i think you'll you know as things happen that's what's going to happen like the gen maybe you know you're younger than me but the generation the next generation will again maybe i don't i wouldn't say rebel because they're not i don't think it's a rebellion so much as it's just wanting to have their version of what it is you know yeah. it's just like what i did snowboarding or whatever it is is like you, you create what you want, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to fall back on the brands that have always been sort of the old reliable brands. Right. It seems like we're all striving for uniqueness in a way, right? And yeah. I, I actually just had a conversation with someone about this, like the power of brand, right? Like there's kind of this push-pull, right? Like we want the most unique thing that no mm -hmm. one else has, but we also are drawn to brands and there's kind of this push and pull and sometimes we're caught in the, in the middle of that. But I, yeah. I really, I like what you said about maybe it's not one or two brands in particular, but this movement towards like regional, mm -hmm. I think is interesting. And, 
and each brand just kind of owning where they're based and and like like you said with Stio or Topo it's like really just like loving where they're based and being sure. really proud of that and and like you know, celebrating where that they're area. based yeah. yeah i think that's really interesting sure. and, and it's interesting that you kind of have both things going on like consolidation bringing a bunch of sure. brands to denver but then you have all these regional players that are also a good time for them right it's super interesting i mean you look at like um I don't know if you know Will Waters and, and Kelly Waters of Western Rise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, in Telluride. And, and I'm good friends with them. And, and they're doing great, you know, even through this downturn. Because, again, the things that are most important fall back to, I mean, of course, you need to have product quality and innovation, all that stuff. But it really comes down to community. And they were able to build a community around the ideal of what their brand stood for um, and what they can offer to their consumer. And the consumers, out there right now, the users, better word probably than consumers, um, you know, respond and want to be part of it and also want to help make sure that those brands continue even through these tough times. Right. So it's, it's pretty inspiring. It's really, really cool. Well, maybe, maybe just a couple last questions. Um, we'll let you get, get back to everything you're working on. But I guess why, um, well, does, does outdoor history influence how you design? Yeah, I mean, Again, for the same reasons we sort of talked about it, I mean, you you have to know where you came from to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I try not to pick history as a design theme where there are brands that, you know, that use sort of, uh, sort of thrift store find Frostline jackets as sort of their design aesthetic, which is super cool. Actually, I really appreciate that they do that because they find value in those things. But that's not you know, kind of from my perspective, I'm always trying to be a little more forward looking than I am looking in the rearview mirror. But again, at the same time, it's, it's just those types of things that keep that history and, and legacy alive. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that's answering your question exactly, but, you know, I, I use the, the past with an eye on the future, right? Yeah. I try not to make the same mistakes as the past. I try to use the inspiration from the past and I try to honor the past, but I, I try to do it in, in a very forward way. Right. I think, no, I think that's great. Um, and then maybe last question, Frostline, what do you think, what do you feel like that the legacy of Frostline is? What do you think the lasting impacts of the company are? You mentioned most people wouldn't know about it. I didn't know about it until I started digging into it, but sure. now I, 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 I hear about it. I talk to people about it and I think, why doesn't everyone know about it and know oh, I, its place in the history? So what, what are your thoughts? You know, um, I think the amount, and I think you can go back to a lot of brands like that, just the, the sort of family tree and the amount of, you know, there are the roots and then there's everything that comes off that. I think it would be probably pretty amazing to see all of the things that have come out of a brand like that. Um, yeah, it's just, it, everything's interrelated, right? Um, and so it would be actually pretty interesting to kind of see what all the people and the people who were inspired by that and where they all went. I mean, I'm a good example of that just because without that, you know, I might be sitting in a cubicle somewhere, you know, selling light bulbs for a living. I don't know. I could be doing anything, but, but I had that sort of history and even that then carried straight over into sort of what was going on and, and what was the most innovative and progressive part of that industry at the time when the snowboarding thing was coming up, you know, and from that and wave rave and the guy, Brett, who owned wave rave is Chip Wilson from Lululemon's brother. Right. And Rick Alden, who started school candy worked with me. I worked with him there and, and just, you, you just start looking just the way everything's so interconnected and all the things that have, have sprouted out of, uh, these communities and these ideas. Um, I don't think you could probably map it out, but I think it'd be pretty interesting if you could. Yeah. But I think that's the legacy. I think the bigger legacy too is just that sort of, again, the do-it-yourself sort of spirit, especially in Frostline's case, the the fact that people could actually get a kit through the mail and make it and it could be theirs and they could customize it. I mean, actually one thing, I'll just say one last thing on that. Um, it's still inspiring people because if you go on eBay, put in Frostline kits, you can actually still buy kits. Um, and one of the sort of Black Diamond legends, Rock Horton, um, 
when I was there just the last couple of years, um, he knew my, or I, he ended up making some Frostline kits he had bought off the internet. He had no idea that I had any history there at all. And I brought in a catalog with my picture in it, and I'm like, ah, look, I was in this, you know? Um, but he, it was still inspiring him. He's addicted to, to building kits and he's buying kits on eBay and sewing them up and getting down all over the house and doing all the things. And it's just that sense of, you know, teaching people they actually can do it themselves. Um, and that sort of accomplishment, I think in those days really probably went out and inspired a lot of people to, to move forward into the things they wanted to do. Well, that's great. I, I think that's a great way to, to end this, but yeah, I think that legacy is felt whether people know where to attribute it or not. Sure. Um, that legacy is there and hopefully we can do what we can to help make people more aware of that, where that legacy comes from. So absolutely. I mean, it affected you, right? And it that did. Affect all the students. And everybody that, that gets near near you, right. the enthusiasm there, and you you can see it, right? So. Right. Well, and that's where a generational change happens, and that's that's what we're trying to do. So cool. Well, Trent, well, thanks always for here to help. Anything you need? Yeah, of course. Thanks for taking a little bit of time to share. Yeah, absolutely.